Thank you very much. Thank you for including me on this panel. It's very exciting to be part of it uh, with this uh, with this great group and uh, an amazing uh, uh, collection of people. And just to be part of um, uh, uh, PAA again is really exciting and great uh, fun. So um, thank you very much. Um, I have a, a, a like a, just a different tone uh, or approach, which I think is going to hopefully make the panel interesting. Um, uh, uh, I start to start with this anecdote where uh, Disney uh, tweeted this uh, um, very positive, progressive message about Pride Month with uh, uh, the, the Mickey Mouse Funhouse people marching uh, in the room for everybody and the, the, um, the, 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 the really uh, just terrible um, response from, the, um, from this random conservative publication, just sort of, you know, with, where anybody, anything associated with sexual orientation is about um, pedophilia. Um, but um, so that's disgusting. But um, but what's interesting is that they put it in, the, I like this phrase, the grand march of progress, the idea that um, the liberal agenda um, uh, of the gay is, um, is, 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 is the progress agenda. So like we are on this, we're on this path forward. And that's kind of what I'm interested in. Um, uh, 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 and where, and this is influenced by this, the seminar I teach every other year or so on families and um, modernity theories, where, um, where demography is, is very hooked up with or hitched, it's hitched to, or, or, or modernity is hitched to demography on questions about sort of this, about developmentalist things, industrialism, capitalism, democracy, individualism, rationality, scientific method. Uh, the demographic transition is, is um, the demographic transition is very much related to all of these things in some complicated, um, un, unstatable or, or tricky ways, but definitely part of that whole story. Um, uh, in retrospect, maybe the second demographic transition seems a little desperate, like we wanted to get our mojo back and be part of like world history happening in, a, in an incontrovertible or inevitable direction. Um, uh, uh, it, seems, it seems almost quaint now, um, although not, you know, it's, it's been, um, I love the second demographic transition, um, uh, but uh, uh, so it's this idea that um, marriage and less, less marriage and later marriage and more cohabitation and fewer children and more divorce and more single parents and uh, flexibility and uh, gender symmetry equality uh, sort of had to do with this shift in values, this Maslowian shift from survival uh, to individual self-realization and uh, democracy, expressive work. And, and anyway, um, uh, Lestage wrote this piece in 2014 sort of defending the idea against critics who said, you know, this is, this is just a very Western idea, sort of like the end of history. Remember when after the Cold War ended and everybody said, that's it, we've arrived, this is the final state. Uh, 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 Western democracy, liberal democracy is the, is the pinnacle of human achievement and now, we just, now it's just mopping up. Uh, now we just need marriage equality, you know, and then we'll, be, we'll have really finally arrived. Um, but I, I, did, I noticed he had this little caveat in there, like, oh, sure, it's going to extend to non-Western societies, just as long as they have a greater accentuation of Maslowian higher order needs and a solid democratic institutions protecting respect for diversity. As long as we have that, you know, then this, then this second demographic transition is assured, um, which does that really describe, you know, our society or the world we live in? Um, uh, uh, so we have the spectacles now of um, uh, guided missiles hitting apartment buildings in modern industrial European cities, which, despite the kind of racist overtone of being shocked at, that it's happening in Europe, is happening in a, in a, in a developed, a more developed society, and that is um, messing with our narrative. Okay, you don't have to be racist to be um, uh, to to see that there's a clash there. Um, the millions of uh, refugees created in just a matter of weeks. Uh, not to mention um, literal war in the streets against um, the very concept of democracy in our country and the existential <clears throat> um, threat of climate change that we're really basically not doing hardly anything about. Um, so the, uh, what I want to kind of say in this talk is um, we can't have this, uh, we can't really have this idea that there's normal society with its normal progression uh, and then like all these other things kind of getting in the way and we're just trying to like study the core of what's really happening. There's like normal, <clears throat> it's modernity, it's on some kind of track, uh, which, uh, uh, which we're trying to get a handle on while we work around all these things like this giant pandemic and climate change and this di diverging growing inequality, which makes it increasingly hard to characterize society in any one way. The, the, the um, centrifugal or fifrical Andrew's going to explain this, um, uh, the, the tendency of, of, of identities to be fragmenting. Um, uh, and then of this policy incoherence. I mean, the idea of modernity 
and demography is partly <clears throat> that we're going to use our scientific rationality to explain the way things should be. And then like the policy that emerges will be the result of the knowledge produced in some way. There's some relationship between uh, uh, all the learning and studying and science we're doing and the policy that comes out of it. And there's a lot of assumptions that that um, the, the behavior of the society reflects the knowledge generated. And there's anyway, so I'll give some examples of how this is not really true. Um, oh, I forgot to start my time. Uh, oh, no, I didn't. I think I have seven minutes, I think, right? Or uh, six. Okay, so I'll go for six. Um, so consider like New Orleans. What's the population of New Orleans? Well, you know, up to 1960, New Orleans, it was industrializing. The cities were growing. It was, it was like modern, modern society and urbanization. Well, so then, so then the population started to fall. Well, we had this kind of unique set of circumstances in America with deindustrialization, especially in our industry, and you know, obviously in our industrial cities. <clears throat> so that was about 20% of 15, 20% of the population. Then we had a giant climate, uh, a climate change driven event, which knocked out half the population and kind of a, a little bit of a resurgence gave back about half of that and now lost a bunch more. Um, possibly as a result of the pandemic. And so what is like the story of New Orleans besides this series of cat catastrophic anomalies? Okay, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. Uh, in the case of divergence, you know, we have this, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this the, the, old, the old modernity idea, like especially, uh, uh, and the second demographic transition is part of this is like, um, uh, 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 we, we, we won't need marriage as much anymore, especially women. Uh, and yet we have this, this basic, that, that lines just show that women with college degrees are now much more likely to be married than women without college degrees. And that's widening. And, and not only does that make it hard to sort of characterize like what direction are we going, but there's a big, a well-being inequality gap. Um, it might be hard to see, uh, but the, the dotted lines show the ratio of single to married mortality um, uh, uh, for men and women uh, uh, and um, uh, in 2017 versus 2007, so the, the gap in well-being in, in survival between married and single people widened just in that 10 years. So this divergence um, threatens our ability to sort of tell a story uh, about one story. Um, that's really undermined in the case of um, uh, fragmenting identities. <clears throat> Not, I love fragmenting identities. I don't mean undermined in the sense of anything bad. But the idea that um, what, what we need to do, and I, I, you know, Gary Gates was right, and Wendy is right, we need to study these things. But the idea that we're going to like nail it down and finally get it, I think is, is just a misnomer. I mean, this process has its own momentum at this point, And we're just going to generate more and more and more identities of all kinds, not just about sex and gender. Uh, but that's just that's just the way we're going. Experiences that people have become identities now. And like you notice, each of these has a flag. It's not just that you've experienced something, it's that you now carry this flag. Um, and there's no reason to think that we're going to stop. So it has its own. Okay, so you can't tell one story. In the case of um, of uh, 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 policy and coherence, I think this really undermines us in ways that we really have not. That it's hard to grapple with, and we might not be able to grapple with it. But consider abortion. I mean, when the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, if they do this year or soon, whenever that is. Um, we're going to have some states that are constitutionally protecting abortion and some states that are immediately criminalizing. It's going to be a felony in Oklahoma or Kansas or wherever just passed that new law. And uh, uh, um, there's no there's no rationality to uh, to either to, to that to that disparity or look at the child tax credit. We had a beautiful evidence based scientifically designed intervention that lifted millions of children out of poverty and we threw it we threw it away because it was inconvenient for Republicans. So it's just that there, there, there was not even a policy case made for eliminating it. They just don't like it. So they got rid of it. Um, let's go brand it. So like, what is the, what, so, so we're going to sit here and be like all rational with our science. Uh, and it, it seems to be having, um, uh, not doing what we, what we expect it to do. So how should we interpret uh, change? Um, uh, uh, I guess, well, I don't know. I, um, th there's this kind of a fetishization of normality. That's all I'm going to say. And I don't want to pick on the Census Bureau for their projections. I don't know how to make projections. But in their projections, total fertility rate is 1.84 for the next 40 years. Um, in their projections, the life expectancy continues to just kind of increase. Um, it hasn't increased in you know 10 years. It's, it fell a lot two years ago. It's probably not going to be increasing a lot anytime soon except maybe to get back a little bit of what we lost in the pandemic. But this kind of assumption, we all learned it in demography. It's like, how fast is life expectancy going to increase? That was the big question. I taught um, methods courses where we asked that question. Um, what if it's just not going to increase anymore? OK, um, so how should you look at it? Well, you know, we have a giant change. This was a very big change in marriage in the last year, um, just from the this is just from the vital records data. 
And you could say, okay, well, at this rate, the last wedding will take place in 2025. Uh, <laughs> Or you can have the more moderate view, like we're in an era of change here. It's going, it's in the direction of downward. It'll ignore the pandemic year and just focus on 2020, 19, in which case we've got until about 2075 till the last marriage. I'm being tongue in cheek. Or you could just sort of take like, we're in an era, we're in the, we're in the period of about seven marriages per thousand. And, uh, uh, and of course there's fluctuations, right? None of those are really um, ideal ways to, to do it. And I think the the problem we have in general about the future is that you can't see the future. The present gets in the way of seeing the future. Uh, um, uh, I love this, I just like penumbras. The penumbra is the part, the shimmery part of the eclipse. Uh, and it is like, it is the light of the future coming at, but it's just the edges of it. So we just get glimpses of it and we're stuck back there. Uh, and I think um, there, there's a, there's a, I guess what I'm, I've become skeptical about, in, about attempts to put us on a track to say that we're on a track from here to there, there being someplace uh, in particular. Um, I, I love the future. I want us to be able to see the future, but it's really hard to do that. Um, so my advice is uh, not, to, not, to, not to stop asking big questions at all, um, but just to um, avoid treating the actual events of the day as anomalies or things that are in the way of our historical development. They are what's happening. They are our society. And, and to watch out for progressivist narratives that assume that they know where we're going. Um, uh, uh, we have momentum, you know, demographers, we understand there's such a thing as momentum, um, but, um, but we can't assume that there's a normality which is coming, which will be back at some point. You know, it reminds me of the, when the FBI decided not to count uh, the deaths on 9-11 uh, as homicides, just, just messed up the statistics basically, but they were murders, they took place, there was just an awful lot of murders that year, but they still don't count them as homicides in that year. Um, so, but anyway, that kind of thing drives me nuts. So, um, uh, do family demography in light of disasters, inequalities, identities, and policies as messy and coherent, unpredictable features of society, not as bugs in the ointment of modern progress. That's my concluding sentence. Thank you.